Good day to you all, wherever you are. I look, look as if we've got people from all over Europe and all over the USA, and uh, the UK is pretty well covered too. So welcome to the British Interplanetary Society's 11th live streaming event. Let's call it an evening lecture because this time we're actually going to have a, a lecture in at the same time as our Q&A. I hope you're all surviving this extended lockdown and that some of you have already had the vaccine. I'm all eagerly waiting my turn. As I said last time, we've got a lot planned for next year. Our big Beyond the Moon symposium on the 12th of April, which happens to be Cosmonauts Day, will be a virtual conference. But we're hoping to run our Reinventing Space Conference on the 28th to 30th of June as a full-blown conference in the QE2 Conference Center in Westminster. I'll tell you more about that if I have time and with our future lecture program at the end. For those who don't know me, I'm Alistair Scott, a past president of the Society, but now as chair of the events committee, I try to keep all our events and activities going. Today, for the first time, we're using Crowdcast both for the presentation and for the Q&A. Let's hope we have a trouble-free session. Please use the question system to ask your questions. And as most of you know, you can also vote for those questions you want to hear asked first. I'm pleased to say that we have an excellent speaker with us tonight to talk about exploring Mars with ground penetrating radar. I would now like, like to hand over to Fabrizio Bernardini, who le leads our BIS Italia branch in Rome, to say a few words and to introduce his colleague, tonight's speaker, and to run the Q&A afterwards. Over to you, Fabrizio. Hello, can you see me? Can you hear me? No. Hello. Hi. Welcome to the BIS again. And uh, can you hear me and see me correctly? Just in case. Alistair, is that fine for you? Yes, it's fine for me. Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. And uh, welcome to everybody. And uh, it's a great pleasure that um, I participated in organizing this lecture for the BIS because we will be introducing my good friend uh, and also boss, uh, Tan Putzig, which is, um, which is uh, an engineer. He's, uh, he has a very long curriculum. He's an engineer. He worked a lot in uh, seismic uh, software after graduation. Then he decided to go back into to research, and especially in space research. And that, and that is where I met him at Washington University in St. Louis because of a common acquaintance. You will know that you will know about him later. And, uh, and then uh, he came to work with our instrument, Sharad, which is this Italian instrument which is orbiting Mars since 2006. And uh, he is now leading the US, uh, he's the US team leader for this instrument, which has a double leadership let's say it's for the operation it's uh, it's in italy which would assign that we did and assign that but most of the science activities managed in the usa and uh, so uh, without uh, extending too much uh, the this uh, introduction because we are still struggling a little bit to make everything work this evening and we apologize in advance for possible hiccups I would like to give the word to Tan, Tan Putzig, and uh, thank, him, thank him a lot uh, for this participation to this event. Thank you, Fabrizio. Um, just a uh, sound check, can you hear me? Perfect, go. Excellent. Um, all right, thank you all for inviting me to uh, present uh, this evening. Um, or this afternoon, if you're with me in the US. Um, I'm uh, excited to tell you about the work that we've been doing with uh, the shallow radar, Sharad, on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter to better understand Mars. Um, and in this uh, presentation, I'll be focusing on the findings having to do with ice on, uh, on and below the surface of Mars. Um, so, Fabrizio, um, could you bring up the uh, presentation? Yes, I need to find the map. Ah, here it is. Can you hear me just in case I need to speak? Uh... I, I hear you. 
Yes, and also apologies if some fonts are not correct because the import process uh, has a complaint about some missing fonts, but uh, no the worries. Is more important mm -hmm. than that. Okay, I need somebody to come. Yes, I think you, yes, I think you can see the presentation. Yes, I see that. Great. Okay. You just give me the lead and I will uh, change the pages. Okay, thank you, Fabrizio. Um, so this title slide shows a artist rendition of the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and the shallow radar uh, instrument, in particular the antenna, um, and a, a representation of the radar signal going down um, to the surface and in, into the subsurface of Mars. Um, I want to uh, take a moment to thank uh, the MRO project, uh, the larger uh, team of uh, Sherrod folks and uh, NASA and JPL um, in particular for the support to um, the SWIM study and I'll explain what that is in, in a little bit. Um, of course, uh, thanks goes out to uh, Asi as well uh, for uh, providing the uh, shallow radar and uh, funding the operations out of the university realm. Next slide, please. Um, so radar sounding, if you're not familiar with it, um, is somewhat like uh, CAT scanning in the medical uh, world. Um, so CAT scan, you may be aware, is uh, takes x-rays of an object um, from a bunch of different angles. Um, and then these these this set of images is uh, they're cross-sectional views of the interior, um, and they can be put together to look at a, a 3D representation of the interior. So on the next slide, um, Fabrizio, uh, you'll see how the uh, CAT scan works here with the CAT, um, or in particular online, which um, we have commonly in the in the neighborhood around here where I live in Colorado. Um, so first you surround your object, in this case the cat, with a cat scanner, um, and you and you make those uh, X-ray images. Um, Fabrizio, next slide, please. Um, so the the axis uh, is uh, along the cat, and then once you've created the uh, and assembled the images. Um, you can see uh, very well now a representation of the surface of the cat in the X-ray uh, view. Um, and on the next slide, uh, you can then peel back the surface layers to see what's going on in the interior. Um, so uh, it's, we're essentially doing the same thing at Mars um, with the, the shallow radar. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but before I get into the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, I wanted to um, kind of reach back uh, to the, uh, the origins of uh, radar sounding. Um, and this, uh, it, well, for planetary radar sound in particular, uh, this began in the Apollo era um, with the Apollo Lunar Sounder Experiment. Um, and the, uh, the team leader for that instrument um, was Roger Phillips. Um, Roger Phillips was also uh, my predecessor as the uh, Sherrod U.S. Deputy Team Leader, um, and he's had a great influence over the uh, the whole field of planetary science in general, um, and certainly in, uh, in radar aspects of that. Um, sadly, uh, Roger Phillips passed away last month um, and um, we were all kind of uh, thunderstruck by that event. Um, we're really going to miss having him around. Um, so this uh, Apollo Lunar Sounder was really the first time that this kind of technology had been brought to bear on space exploration. Um, and as you can see in the lower left, there's a couple of examples here of radargrams or profile cuts uh, through the marsh or the the lunar surface, uh, showing some of the features uh, in the interior. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, so as I mentioned, uh, you know, Ro Roger was uh, the deputy team leader and very instrumental in the design um, and the um, and much of the, the mission um, of uh, Sherrod on aboard MRO. Um, as Fabrizio mentioned, the the um, Sherrod is an Italian designed and operated instrument um, provided by ASI and operated out of the University of Rome with team leader uh, Roberto Seu. Um, and then the US operations uh, initially led by Roger at uh, Washington University in St. Louis. Um, and then we moved to the Southwest Research Institute um, in uh, 2007. Um, and then Roger uh, retired in 2015, and then I, I took over as U.S. team lead. Um, so, um, of course, we had uh, many trips to Italy to discuss uh, the results coming out of the mission and plans for operations. Next slide, please. Um, so the uh, Sherrod was, uh, you know, uh, um, integrated in, into the MRO spacecraft and launched in August of 2005. Um, it got into orbit at Mars in, uh, in March of, of 2006, um, and the orbit was then circularized um, through aerial braking, um, and science operations began in earnest in the fall of 2006. Um, and that was the point when I joined the Sherrod team uh, with Roger at uh, Washington University. Um, I should mention too that um, Sherrod was not actually the first um, radar sounder to get to Mars. Um, it was preceded by MARSIS, um, which is another Aussie uh, built sounder aboard Mars Express, uh, which is also still operating today. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is an animation. Hopefully this will run here. Uh, go ahead and start it if you can, Fabrizio. Um, showing the uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and the Sherrod instrument passing over the surface of Mars. Um, so uh, the, the signal, the radar signal is emitted from this antenna um, and impinges on the surface. And much of the energy is um, reflected off of the nadir track below the spacecraft as shown in this animation. Um, but some of that signal actually transmits into the subsurface. This allows us to create these profile views of radar reflectivity within the subsurface. Um, and from them, you can infer the existence of these layered uh, terrains here in the polar ice cap, the, the North Polar Ice Cap of Mars. Um, so this animation is actually created entirely with Mars data from Im image data, elevation data, and the radar data itself. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so these are um, some of the earlier um, radar grams, these two-dimensional profile views of the uh, North Polar Cap. Um, and they were they were quite stunning. We weren't quite sure whether we'd be able to see this level of detail uh, going in. Um, and um, the the uh, this fine layering within the polar caps was really um, pretty tremendous to see. Um, we think that the kind of the periodicity of the layering is related to climate change on on Mars. Um, over approximately the last four million years. Um, so these results um, made a big splash in the, in the scientific world, um, garnering a cover on the uh, science magazine in 2007. Next slide, please. Um, so because the mission has, has um, fortunately gone on as long as it has, we've gotten extremely dense coverage, especially in the polar regions of Mars. Um, this enables us to actually do that sort of CAT scan that I was talking about with that um, illusion earlier um, with, the, with the radar data. So these are huge 3D data volumes that span 
well over a thousand kilometers in each direction horizontally and up to uh, four kilometers in depth through the ices of the polar caps. Um, they've allowed us to see the um, interiors of these polar caps in a whole new way. Um, the structures of the layering um, we, th we think are uh, very much related to the changes in climate in the latter um, hundreds of millions of years of Martian history. Um, in the north, we get very strong returns from the base. Um, these tell us that the ice is relatively pure. The south, the returns are patchier, the radar is lossy. Um, and this is an indicator that the ice is dirtier um, and older. Um, the, uh, the, the south also holds um, what we've found to be CO2 ice deposits that uh, Fabrizio is pointing to here um, and that are indicated with the red arrows on the um, view on the right. Um, these sit atop the South Polar cap of which is predominantly water ice. Um, and they're indicative of episodes of atmospheric collapse that have actually occurred fairly recently in geologic terms, like within the last uh, million years or so. Um, they currently hold enough CO2 that if they were released into the Martian atmosphere, they would double the atmospheric pressure. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, moving off of the polar caps um, down into the higher uh, uh, latitudes uh, surrounding the polar region, um, we, we come down into the, the northern plains um, and look at some radar examples here um, from the Phoenix landing site. Um, so uh, interestingly, uh, we've, we've trained the radar on all of the, the past landing sites on Mars, um, but only at the Phoenix site do we see really clear evidence of a, a subsurface radar return. Um, and even that evidence is, is a little bit lower signal to noise, say, than um, for the, those nice layers we see in the polar cap. Um, but nevertheless, we were able to map this um, uh, layer out all across the region surrounding the Phoenix Lander, which was um, commonly referred to as the Green Valley. Um, we mapped this out and found that um, it was variable in depth um, between about 15 and 65 meters. Um, it covered a fairly large area across this valley. Um, and we think that the returns are likely related to ground ice the, and probably the bottom of the ground ice. Um, we know that the, the, the ground ice here is extremely shallow from the Phoenix Lander itself. It could dig down just a few centimeters and, and find that ice, um, but we don't see it in the radar data. Um, I also wanna point out here the uh, uh, use of the um, simulated uh, returns in the, in the bottom panel here. This shows a simulation of the radar returns expected only from the surface. Um, and because the radar doesn't go only down at Nader, it, you get returns from all around the track. Um, we, we use these simulations to try to understand uh, features that could be mistaken for subsurface returns, but are actually what we call surface clutter. This is returns from off Nader that come in later than the first return from the nadir surface. Um, so some of these are pointed out in the simulation and you can compare them to the radiogram itself and see that, yes, in fact, you see the, the surface clutter in the radar data, but you also see this yellow highlighted return just below the surface return that doesn't show up in the simulation. And this gives us some confidence that that is in fact a subsurface uh, reflection. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I said uh, we don't get a detection of the top of the ground ice. Well, why is that? It's it's because it's too shallow. the the um, The radar signal has a certain um, resol uh, vertical resolution um, shown here, sort of graphically on the left, um, and that resolution is about 15 meters in in the um, 
uh, space above the surface. Um, it gets a little bit finer in the subsurface, maybe eight to 10 meters, depending on the materials. Um, because of that relatively coarse vertical resolution, um, we're not able to see the top of that ground ice, which is only a few centimeters to tens of centimeters deep. Um, the return that we do get is probably from the base of the ground ice, although it's possible that the re deeper return is some other geologic interface, say between um, the bedrock and ice-free sediments with a shallower, even shallower base of ground ice. Um, one of the, the reasons why the, we don't fully understand what's going on at Phoenix is that um, there, there are no cuts, geologic cuts at the surface through these layers. Um, so we don't have any independent um, data to tell us uh, what the stratigraphy, the, you know, the layer structure is um, below the Phoenix landing site. Next slide, please. Um, so moving a little further south into the mid mid latitudes of Mars, um, we encounter these morphologic features that have been known for many decades now, um, that are referred to as lobate debris aprons, and they have these flow lineations on them um, that are extremely suggestive of some sort of ice action um, at the surface and the flow of materials. Um, over long periods of time. Um, the, so the, there's a pretty clear suggestion that ice is involved here, um, but for many years it, it wasn't not well known um, how much ice. Um, so the end members to this scenario are low quantities of ice, like 10%, where you, you, the ice is just lubricating the debris, the rocky debris, uh, and allowing it to flow. Um, and the high end member is 95% ice where the, the the structures are predominantly ice with a, a veneer of debris on their surface, what we call debris covered glaciers. Um, so this was debated for decades uh, until the radar came along and solved this problem. Um, next slide, please, Fabrizio. Um, so the Sherrod data pretty clearly demonstrates that these are, in fact, debris-covered glaciers with a very high percentage of ice. Um, the reason is that we see a very strong return from the base of these features. And if you look at the, um, the depth-corrected radar gram in the second panel here with the white arrows on it, um, so this is where we've taken the, the radar delay times and corrected them to depth assuming that the surface, subsurface is ice. Uh, you'll note that where we see these late returns that don't appear in the clutter simulation, um, with that depth correction, they, they line up very well with the surrounding flat terrains um, outside of these low-bait debris aprons. And this tells us that they are very likely nearly pure ice. Um, in addition, the strength of the reflection, you know, these are very high, um, amplitude or power or reflections from the base. Um, the fact that we're not losing a lot of radar energy going through a bunch of debris tells us again that these are very pure um, in their ice content. Um, as with the Phoenix site, however, we don't uh, generally see a clear upper surface uh, detection um, to, to to give us a clear handle on exactly how thick that debris is. Um, but the, the lack of a detection is suggestive that the, that debris layer is probably less than 10 to 20 meters uh, in depth. Um, and the strength of the return um, also indicates that there can't be an awful lot of debris thickness at the top. Next slide, please. Um, so there are other regions uh, all across the northern plains of Mars um, where there's thought to be uh, buried ice in, just in, within the, um, the regolith or uh, layers within the regolith um, that aren't, aren't associated with these uh, glacial features. 
um, we call this ground ice in the in the terrestrial uh, uh, glaciological world, um, and we've taken to using that same term on Mars as well. Um, and um, for a long time, it wasn't too well known, you know, if, if the ice was actually still there, and if so, um, at what concentrations. Um, but with uh, a combination of data, the MRO cameras, um, and in particular, the ability to do stereo imaging, um, and therefore uh, be able to um, assess the, the depth of this crater, um, we're able to um, give some constraints to the radar data um, to, to make an estimate of the ice content in the upper layers uh, in this area. Um, and the first indications um, from, as reported in this study by Bramson et al, were that this was a very ice rich layer, um, you know, up, up to, uh, well, on an average about 40 meters thickness um, and extending over a huge area of a million square kilometers, which is about three times the area of the British Isles, for example. Um, and it extends down to latitudes uh, of 38 degrees north. And now this is starting to get exciting in the context of uh, future human missions where um, these lower latitudes are um, much more um, feasible to get to um, because they have, you know, um, uh, warmer temperatures um, that will help uh, sustain operations on the ground. Um, so then this ice could potentially serve as a resource for these uh, future human explorers, uh, much more um, uh, reasonably so than say at the poles. Uh, next slide please Fabrizio. So um, as that prior example shows, um, having more than one data set um, is really key to try to understand what's going on with ice and other features on Mars. Um, and NASA recognized this number years ago. Um, they also recognized that ice can serve as a extremely valuable resource, not only as a, uh, a source for you know, drinking water and that kind of thing, but you can make fuel out of it quite readily um, to refuel a rocket to launch back off of the surface of Mars or to fuel operations on the ground. Um, and for that reason, they uh, uh, started a uh, effort to really focus in on mapping ice as a res potential resource. Um, and that's how the Mars swim team was born. This is the Mars subsurface water ice mapping team um, that I lead with uh, a, a fellow uh, Sherrod, um, participant, uh, Gareth Morgan. Um, so the, the swim team has been operating for a couple of years now, um, combining the shallow and deep sensing data sets, the, you know, the imagery, uh, thermal data, neutron spectrometer data, uh, as well as the radar data and um, geomorphological interpretations based on imagery and elevation data. Um, and we're mapping um, these data sets together. Um, and uh, because they're such disparate data sets, we, we had to come up with a, some means to sort of quantify what they are collectively telling us. And um, so we developed the concept of, of ice consistency. Um, so for each data set, we assign some ice consistency values. Um, so Fabrizio, if you go on to the next slide, um, provide a little more detail on that. Um, so the, uh, the ice consistency then is, is done for each one of these data sets, and then we integrate them together um, into a combined ice consistency map based on all of the data sets. Um, and we've, we've kind of gone through cycles of different ways of combining these, um, weighting them differently depending on what the zone of interest might be. Um, so this map here represents the, uh, the integrated ice consistency for the Northern Hemisphere from our first year of the study. Um, it's mapped at about 20 pixels per degree. 
Um, the positive ice consistency values are the ones in blue here. Um, as expected, they're um, pretty pervasive in the very higher latitudes, um, but they do extend down to lower latitudes. Um, Fabrizio, could you bring up the next slide? So some of the uh, regions of, uh, in here we have, I've kind of, uh, we've cut out the, um, the inconsistent um, values in red uh, to sort of highlight the, the positive consistency values here. Um, and some of these bluer tones are uh, extending down to latitudes even below 30 degrees north. So these are pretty clear indicators that we really want to go in and focus on these areas. Um, because the closer we can get to the equator with a, uh, a confident discovery of ice, um, the more likely um, that we'll be able to send humans to these locations and be able to support their activities. Um, so um, the uh, one of the things that we always strive for in planetary science is, is what we call ground truth. And that's like confirming data sets that tell you for certain that your inferences from other data sets are, are on the mark. Um, and one of the uh, so-called ground truths that we have for Mars are what we call uh, ice exposing impacts. Um, so MRO, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter has been able to spot impacts occurring during the course of the mission. Um, and uh, some of these impacts expose ice at the surface. We can see the white coloration of the ice. Um, and in some instances, we also see some spectral uh, indicators of them being ice rich. Um, this is reported in this Dundas et al. paper. Um, and so these ice exposing impacts shown here in white dots on the map um, are corresponding quite nicely in areas that we mapped in the SWIM project with these high ice consistency values. So this gives us some confidence that um, our efforts to tease out as much as we can from these data sets is working quite well. Um, so in the lower left, there's some information about um, where you can get um, these mapping results uh, from our Northern Hemisphere study. Um, we are planning to uh, expand, we have been expanding this study to include the Southern Hemisphere. So in the next slide, I'll uh, give a little bit of preview of that uh, work. Um, so our, our second season uh, of mapping has recently ended. Um, the results are in review at NASA. Um, we're going to make them available soon on that same website, but here's kind of a sneak preview showing another um, composite ice consistency map now with both the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. Um, and there's, um, you know, the, the uh, results have been extended not just in the southern hemisphere, but we kind of filled in that gap um, in the high mountainous region of Tharsis uh, in the north. Um, there's other enhancements involved here in the geomorphic mapping, the thermal analysis, and the and the radar analysis that are some of them applied globally across the uh, whole data sets. Uh, so stay tuned uh, for announcements about that data set becoming available. Um, next slide, please. Um, so to wrap up here. Um, the the sounding radars uh, here, and I, I didn't really get a chance to talk much about Marsis, but there's some great results coming out of that one as well. They're both shedding a whole new light in our understanding um, of the polar deposits as well as the mid-latitude ices on Mars and the connection that they have to the, these deposits have to the climate history. Um, the strong basal returns that we're getting from the mid-latitude glaciers clearly demonstrate how ice rich they are uh, under a veneer of debris. Um, the, the, the debris layer is too thin for us to resolve with these radars. Um, so, uh, and that that is kind of an issue for, um, uh, you know, really planning out how to access this ice on future human missions. Um, 
and uh, not, not just in the debris covered glaciers, but also in the ground ice areas. So we really need to redouble our effort to locate this ice and better establish, you know, that, that debris cover thickness um, and the concentration of the ice at depth. Um, so that's kind of a, a plug for a new mission to Mars with a higher resolution radar and orbit and, you know, ground penetrating ra radar and other methods on the ground uh, to assess these um, resources. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there and I'm happy to address questions. Oh, yeah, uh, there is a, a full list of references in here as well. Um, and certainly uh, feel free to contact me in, uh, directly if you have uh, questions and follow up. Okay. Can you hear me, Dan? I can. Good. So thank you a lot. Thank, thanks a lot for this review of all the outstanding results of the stuff we are working on since many years. And uh, and uh, I have to see that every time that uh, I review a little bit these uh, science summaries, uh, it, it's incredible how this uh, noisy data we get from the radar yeah. get uh, processed, cleaned, and interpreted in such a powerful way. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would like to highlight uh, that, uh, personally speaking, that these maps of the water ice consistency are the first in the history of humankind. These are the first uh, real mapping of an important resource on another celestial body. So we are living in a, in a very peculiar moment of history in which uh, humanity is now prospecting for a resource on another planet. So far, we just said, oh, there could be metals, there could be ice there, there could be water. But here we are measuring it. We know how much it is. So we have some uncertainties, but we know for sure that it's there. And we are mapping that. We are even giving probability of how much you can find and at which depth. So it's, it's a very special moment in time that, uh, and also with all the other events which are happening around uh, in the space sector, I think it's very beneficial uh, for, a, for a good message on which is the better direction in where to go. And uh, so we are building up questions right now. So I, let me check uh, how it's mm -hmm. going. And uh, please, please continue typing your questions. Uh, and, uh, and I will uh, gladly give the possibility to the speaker to ask the question in person. So be prepared, uh, be prepared to, to give your question if you want. Otherwise, you just say no and then uh, and then uh, I will read it for uh, for Tan. And I have a question for myself, just just to leave a little bit of time for other people to to write this. Tan, can you explain a little bit what does it mean to graduate and get a very successful career in one sector, and then suddenly decide to sell everything and go back to science? Would you recommend it now to young people, or would what do you recommend today for people that wants to participate in this kind of endeavors? Oh, sure. Yeah. So uh, Fabrizio is referring to an earlier career that I didn't really discuss here. It was uh, I? I worked in the oil and gas industry as a geophysicist um, using seismic uh, exploration methods. Um, to look for oil and gas on, on the earth um, in, in the 1990s. Um, and and um, I, toward the end of that uh, phase of my life, I decided I wanted to uh, expand my horizons and um, take up planetary science. Um, so I, I made a big career move um, by uh, going back to graduate school uh, in my mid thirties and, um, and retooling for planetary science. Um, one of the uh, things that I had hoped to be able to do when I made that choice was to bring the skills that I had developed in the, in the prior career to bear in the new one. Um, and that's actually worked out quite well. The, um, you know, the 3D uh, radar imaging work that we did, um, which I showed you at the beginning of the presentation, 
that was using uh, software developed for um, seismic data um, on terrestrial applications. Um, and so it was a you know, very direct transference of those skills. And I, you know, I had no assurance that, that that would ever happen when I went back to graduate school. The, the radar um, uh, investigations, I, I wasn't even aware of them when I, I started graduate school. They hadn't really started yet. Um, but you never know where things are going to lead. Um, and I, you know, I'm very happy that I made that choice and um, I'm even happier that I was able to, you know, bring some of those skills along and, and um, uh, apply them to this new data set. Okay. Um, so for, well, you mentioned something about, um, you know, prospecting on, on Mars with this data and it's true. I mean, we are doing that. Um, but I, I want to point out that, you know, these instruments and the data weren't really designed for prospecting. They're, they're designed for science purposes. Um, so, um, you know, imagine how much better we could do should we actually design the instrumentation for the prospecting goals. Okay, sorry, sorry, I'm answering a question. Okay, thank you, thank you, thanks a lot. So, you, would you would you recommend this as a possible career for a new oh, scientist? Certainly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think um, you know you you got to follow your dreams and um, and and do the uh, things that interest you most. Um, you know, I my career, if I'd stayed in oil and gas, perhaps could have been more lucrative financially, but um, intellectually. Uh, I'm I'm very happy with having switched into planetary sciences. It's it's in many ways it's a much more challenging, um, but it, I find it more rewarding um, personally. Good, good. So let's start with the question with the audience. So I have a question from Peter Robinson that I unfortunately cannot speak because he has no microphone. So the, I read the question for him. It's been voted at the top of the list. The question is. Is the radar resolution sufficient to detect lava tubes or any other subsurface voids that could be used for habitation? If not, could that be achieved with future radars? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, we've certainly been thinking about that and looking into it. Um, there's been a um, published detection of a lava tube on the moon with the uh, lunar radar sounder on the Selene spacecraft. Um, there's some debate over um, the nature of that detection, um, but it's, um, it's, it's likely that if you have a very large lava tube, you could potentially detect it with, with that instrument. Um, that instrument has very similar um, capabilities to Sherrod. Um, and we have been kind of combing through the Sherrod data set over areas of, of known or suspected lava tubes on Mars um, to see what we're able to glean from the data. Um, so far, no one's uh, found anything really um, definitive, um, but I, I am holding out hope that we are able to um, discern a lava tube or two with the current data um, from Sherrod. Um, and certainly if we get a higher resolution radar um, at Mars, uh, presumably it'll, it'll have both higher vertical, you know, finer vertical resolution, and finer lateral resolution. And then we really ought to be able to find these features um, much more um, confidently. Okay. I have another question from Isaac. And uh, do you, can you be clear to speak? Sure. Isaac? No, we can't hear you. He doesn't know why. Your lips are moving, no sounds coming out. <laughs> we see the video. We don't want to see the video, we want to see the voice. <laughs> no problem, I can read it. We do the successes oh. of for Sherrod. Are you here? Yeah, go no. ahead. 
So the question is, with all the successes for Charade, where do we go from here? New discoveries, new instruments? Yeah, right. I mean, so I alluded to that at the, the end of the talk and um, in some of this discussion. Um, I think the most obviously needed thing is a, a higher resolution radar. Um, and there, you know, there, there are different types of radar. The ones that I've been discussing here today are sounding radars that are attempting to get data, um, signals into the subsurface and discrete returns from the subsurface. Um, but one can also use what is called an imaging radar where you kind of look off to the side and you record the um, reflections that come back and they give you more of a, an assessment of the shallower subsurface um, within a certain depth. Um, so that, that method could be extremely useful in trying to map out the extent of this ground ice and the ices in the low bay debris aprons. Um, and one could also then use this in a sounding mode to more definitively define the thickness of that overburden. Um, so those two data sets together would give you a great ability to map out the ice uh, broadly and give a good estimate of its, its um, depth uh, to the top of the ice and the richness of the ice in the subsurface. Um, and then certainly there, there are other complementary data sets that would help with this endeavor. Um, and at some point we'll need to get to the ground and then there's other, other um, a host of other methods that can be used to look for, map out and assess that ice. Good, thank you. And uh, I said, do you want to give a feedback uh, if you want to type something quickly or not? Uh... Okay. And um, Charles, I see, I see you on the screen. Hi. Can, can you hear me? Perfect. Great. Um, yeah, the uh, the image you showed of the northern North Pole looked like it was the water the ice availability looked rather like the shape of the Northern Ocean or the, the fossil shoreline that's been detected. Mm. Do you think that's the reason for it being there? Um, not necessarily. The, I mean, the, uh, it's been known for many decades that uh, just uh, from a, even a theoretical standpoint, that ice should be stable in these latitudes at shallow depths. Um, you know, partly the, the elevation plays into that, um, but uh, it's also true in the southern hemisphere that are much higher elevations. Um, so it, it's not a clear indicator of the uh, of support for the ocean uh, hypothesis. Um, the, you know, the, if there were an ocean at any point, it, it, it would have probably been billions of years ago. Um, and so interactions with the atmosphere uh, could easily have, have driven the, at least the shallow portions of that ocean um, off to the polar caps or into space. Um, if, if it existed. Uh, so it's, what we're seeing now, now is, you know, the present day presence of the ice that is some combination of recent climate moving ice off and uh, onto the polar caps. Um, and then just the, the date of uh, the annual interaction with the atmosphere. So it's long term sublimation and redeposition. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Long term in, in the well, thousands to millions of years time frame versus billions, right? Okay, that's a great answer. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay, I have a question from Francis Butcher. It says, hi, Tan. What is your interpretation of the hypothesized radar detection of a south polar subglacial lake from Mars? What improvements would we need on future instruments to get a better insight? Um, that's a great question. Um, I, so there's, um, there's some debate, right, in the scientific community about the uh, interpretation of the, these very strong reflections from the base of the South Polar Cap that um, have been attributed to the presence of liquid water. Um, and um, I think, you know, one of the reasons this debate is still going is because we don't have a, the best data uh, to fully un understand exactly what's going on. Um, so I think, you know, continuing to do uh, 
you know, thoughtful modeling of the, the radar data and other um, effects that um, could potentially explain this with an alternative hypothesis um, should be pursued. Um, the, you know, at this stage, though, the, you know, the uh, hypothesis has been presented as the most likely explanation for the existing data, and it's hard to argue against that. Um, as far as trying to resolve it with new data sets, I'm not quite sure exactly what might help with that. Um, you know, the newer radars we've been talking about with higher frequencies are, are more aimed at the shallow, you know, resolving the, the depth to that ice and that kind of thing. And they're not really going to contribute to understanding what's going on. You know, this is down a kilometer and a half below the ice. Um, if, you know, the, the discovery was made with the Marsis data set um, and the Shira data uh, over that area uh, appears, we appear to have attenuation of the radar signal long before it even gets to that depth. Um, so probably less than even a kilometer um, down. So a good several hundred meters above that um, base, we kind of lose the Sherrod signal. Um, so, you know, short of sending a drill or something down there, um, which would be quite an undertaking, uh, I, I'm not quite sure what future instrumentation um, could be brought to bear on that problem. Okay, Francis, you happy if you want to type something or I go on? And Tan, do you have the camera on active? Yes. I don't see you. Oh, people, does people see you? Do people see you? I'm not sure about this moment. I see me. I actually, oh, sometimes I see you, sometimes I don't. No, I don't see you actually. Mm -hmm. I, I see a fixed background. Ah, no, okay, 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 they see you, they see you. Okay, yeah, I understood, I understood, perfect. So I have another question. Carlo, do you want to say the question yourself? And I didn't ask. Um, no, I will ask the question for Carlo. Uh, beware that Carlo left a career in aerospace and uh, to go to in the radar sector. So beware of this question. Hello, mm -hmm. and thank you for your presentation. Do you think we need uh, a radar sounder using a carrier frequency different from Mars's and Shared ones? Oh yeah, certainly. I mean the um, you know, one of the the. Uh, findings of, of several science panels that have been put together over recent years is that um, a high priority is a, a, um, a radar that will provide a higher, uh, well, a finer resolution. Um, and um, this means at higher, at higher frequencies because the, the resolution is controlled by the bandwidth of the radar. Um, and at the Marsis or Sherrod frequencies, you cannot make the bandwidth broad enough um, to get to the, the desired uh, high, uh, finer vertical resolutions. Um, therefore, you need to go to um, significantly higher frequencies, probably in, in the hundreds of megahertz up to gigahertz or potentially even more um, range. Okay, so, and uh, now I have a question from, uh, sorry, I forgot to ask him before, to, from, uh, I, I uh, sorry, there has been some voting. Uh, mm -hmm. Ah, Carlo is, uh, Carlo is uh, answering back. He says, if you could give, if you, could you give some reference on this debate? Which debate are, are we talking about? About the operating frequency of the radar. Um, well, I, I don't know if I can give specific references. I, I mean, there's some reports that have been put out. There's the um, the uh, NEXAG report. It's called N E X S A G. It's a NASA uh, or Mars Exploration Program. Um, report um, concerning a new radar. And then more recently, um, the um, uh, so-called ICESAG, I-C-E-S-A-G, 
uh, another uh, report uh, uh, about that topic. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I would recommend reading those reports and there's certainly tons of references in each of those um, that one could peruse to follow up on that. Okay, so uh, some question bounced up, but uh, we already have Renato online. Renato, do you want to ask your question to Dan? This is a Renato you know. Okay. Yes, I, how are you doing, Renato? It's good to see you. I'm fine. I'm, I'm afraid <laughs> now, I might not be able to answer. <laughs> oh, I think you have already answered the question, actually. <laughs> so the question was about uh, the possibility for use uh, synthetic aperture radar in the pure L band to, to map the surface ice, but I understand yeah, that yeah. It, yes. And yeah. uh, it would be nice if you have uh, to get some reference about uh, the study being done on this. Sure, yeah, no. I, um, so, yeah, I mean, so the specific concerns about a P versus L band. I'm not sure how much publication there's been on that recently. Um, there certainly were some um, publications about it uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and um, I don't think it was a completely resolved debate. In some of the, the debate circles around um, not knowing for sure what the penetration depths might be which is because we don't know well enough what the near surface conditions at Mars are. I mean, certainly there are examples of using these different frequency bands on the Earth, um, and depending on the material properties, um, they, they are either capable or incapable of getting to certain depths. Um, but on the Earth, it's often fought with uh, wa water being a major factor in that. Um, and not just um, like bulk water, but even interstitial water um, that can broadly affect the results. Um, and presumably on Mars, um, the, any presence of the, these, you know, uh, these kind of uh, liquid waters is going to be much less. Um, so therefore, one can hope that the higher frequencies will get greater penetration depths than they do in terrestrial environments. Okay, in fact, I, I, I'm or thinking about the name. something about Sherrod, <laughs> since you know more about it than I do. <laughs> hey, thanks, uh, Dan. Sure. Thank you, Renato. Okay, so we have a question from David. David cannot speak. David Coco, and uh, I will uh, read it. It's a long, be prepared. First human landing sites on the Red Planet. Have there been contacts with companies not strictly related to space mining to understand how to adapt the equipment and tools for future ice mining? Is there radar information that can optimize this extraction process? Um, well, yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, one of the goals of the SWIM project is to provide um, as much information as we can glean from not just the radar data, but all of the ice relevant data sets um, to, to help inform both planning of uh, future human landings and the extraction of ice as a resource um at those sand landing sites as well as to inform the bounds of what we uh, know or can know from the current data and therefore inform the future mission planning for new radars in orbit and um, other uh, instrumentation on the ground um, there certainly are discussions going on amongst various companies that have more versus less experience in space. Um, I've been involved in a number of um, proposals um, for trying to bring uh, other terrestrial technologies to bear. For, for example, I, I've been talking with um, some uh, seismological uh, uh, equipment companies about um, bringing the 
capabilities up to the level where we can fly them on future human or future robotic missions, um, but could also be used on future human missions. So things like you know seismometers, small uh, seismometers for shallow prospecting, what, what are called geophones, um, and then you know sources for that, whether it be a kind of a weight drop system or small explosives or vibrating sources. Um, so there's, I, I think there's a whole wealth of knowledge about these kind of things terrestrial, terrestrially, uh, including companies that are very versed in, in developing these instruments that may not um, have a lot of space experience yet, but I think they, they soon will if they take an interest in these topics. Okay. I have another question, and uh, apparently doesn't want to because I have no feedback, but it's a double question from two different people that basically they say the same thing. So the first question from Rich is, are, are other substance, substances such as minerals readily detectable with the radar data? And from Rod Woodcock, which is one of our council members, will future radar be able to look for minerals? One is about now, and one is about the future. Same question. Um, right. So, I mean, the current um, sounding radars at Mars um, aren't um, terribly capable of uh, detecting specific minerals. Um, they, they can kind of, uh, together with other data sets like the elevation data, um, they can be used to constrain, um, you know, the uh, uh, radar the radar transmission properties of the materials like the velocity the rate the signal through the subsurface and that can be used to infer um, the um, mineral properties kind of like we did with the the co2 ice detections in the south pole um, but um, you know teasing out specific uh, geological minerals um, isn't isn't something we can really do very well with the current radars. Um, you know, um, radars that have uh, 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 greater capabilities, like you know, circular polarization radars, uh, those kind of things, you, you can begin to tease out a little more information about um, the the uh, how the radar signal interacts with the subsurface that may give you a, a closer constraints on that kind of thing. I, I know that on the moon, um, uh, there's the presence of a lot of titanium in the, in the soil, and that has a very distinctive effect on the radars there, both the Earth-based radars like Arecibo, may it rest in peace, um, and the, um, the mini-RF on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Okay, okay, thanks. I have a question from Jerry Stone, one of our fellows. And uh, Elizabeth, is Jerry online? Jerry, can you hear me? Jerry has accepted, but he's not appeared yet, so we might need to go ahead. Yeah, Jerry, did you accept the invitation to appear? And Elizabeth is giving you the permission to, you have to answer it. I think you have to answer OK to an invitation to. Yeah, you have to accept the invitation and then activate your camera, if you need the camera. Try speaking. No joy. Probably I should go ahead and read the question myself then. Well, okay, let's let's wait just for a moment. Okay, just a moment. Uh. Uh, 
Uh -huh. can I see me, Jerry. Jerry, can you can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're perfect. Go, Jerry. Go, go, go. We're okay. Hi right, then. Uh, first of all, as uh, if I move to the side, you can see a great fan of 2001 and your lighting down the side and everything. When I first saw it, it reminded me immediately of the briefing room on Clavius Base. Oh, right. <laughs> so congratulations from that. Um, <laughs> the the Mars Society's plan, Mars Direct. Um, meant sending an unmanned return craft to Mars, which mm. would land and convert the six tons of liquid hydrogen that it would carry, mm. would, um, combine it with the Mars atmosphere of carbon dioxide to make methane for the return trip. Yeah. However, with the discovery of subsurface ice on Mars, they said, well, we don't need to send the hydrogen. We can obtain it from the ice which also mm -hmm. means theoretically that um, you've got six tons of payload capacity for rovers and other equipment for um, for the astronauts when they follow on. I uh, wondered if you'd like to say anything about this. Yeah, certainly. I mean, that um, a lot of the renewed interest in um, and push for uh, sending humans to Mars, I, I think, is is predicated on this discovery that there is this near surface ice and it can serve as a resource of that nature. Um, and that's, I, I think, a lot of the um, reason for the excitement about our, you know, our being able to do this um, is, um, you know, we know this ice is there now. Um, it's really, uh, you know, it's in vast quantities. I mean, the the mapping that we've done with um, the SWIM project and large, more broadly with the Sharad uh, team um, indicates that, you know, there's extremely um, large deposits of ice in these debris-covered glaciers in particular. They are up to a kilometer thick and they extend over many tens of kilometers, uh, hundreds of kilometers. Um, in extent, um, and they extend over regions that are thousands of kilometers across. Um, so there's a huge resource there. Um, it's just up to us to figure out how best to get to it and extract that ice um, so we can do this refueling at the surface. Um, and whether that has to be done robotically or whether you send the humans along to do that with a, with a small supply of hydrogen um, I think it's still being worked out. Well, the, if essentially, it gives us uh, supplies of oxygen as well. Um, sure. So oxygen and hydrogen, if you want to fuel yeah. your vehicles that way, as well as water to drink. I remember yeah. reports, I mean, it's going back some years now, that uh, mm -hmm. it was calculated at the time that there was enough subsurface water that if it was all brought up to ground level, no, if it melted, brought up to ground level, it would cover the entire planet to a depth of about 300 meters. That is a massive amount, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question is, how come it went undetected all that time? Well, it's not been entirely undetected. I mean, the polar caps we've known about since, oh, yes. I think, or nine. Um, but there was some debate over whether they were water ice or CO2 ice predominantly, yeah, and that's yeah. been mostly settled. Um, the, um, and, the, and the thickness of the polar caps wasn't very well known until the radars came along. Um, it, it actually was thought that the radar caps would be thicker than they appear to be um, due to the um, bending of the, the crust beneath them to uh, support the load of the ice on top. Yeah. Uh, but it turns out that that um, deflection is not nearly as big as was expected. Um, and the, the, so the ice cap's actually a little thinner than was uh, previously considered. Um, this was one of the early findings with Sherrod that um, came as a big surprise. Okay. Uh, but it, it doesn't it doesn't make a big dent though in that the overall global inventory of ice.
Okay. Thanks very much. Sure. Thanks, Jerry. Good to see you again. And uh, another question from Alex. Alex is asking if uh, in the terraced uh, crater you mentioned that that more recent result suggests the layers may have lower ice content. Can you please expand mm -hmm. on this? Right. Um, so the um, that that early uh, result was an interpretation from a few craters in the area, um, and a and a kind of a extrapolation across the region. Um, and then we followed up that with um, more um, uh, topographic features, not just the craters, but other mesas and um, valleys of, of sorts um, to, to try to bring in more data points to constrain the, those properties. In addition, some uh, work by uh, Campbell and Morgan uh, published in 2018, um, they tried to tease some more information out of the radar data by splitting the signal into um, dif different subbands and comparing the radar behavior in the different subbands to get an assessment of radar loss properties, which are directly related to the um, purity of the ice. Um, and they found that the losses were larger than expected for nearly pure water ice. Um, so that suggested that the ice content is, is somewhat lower than was presented in that first paper. Um, but it doesn't mean there's no, no ice there. I mean, the, there certainly are, um, uh, the, the, the radar result remains consistent with the presence of ice and then there are many indications from other data sets like the geomorphic data um, that point to um, a, a sig substantial presence of ice in, the, in this um, region. Okay, thanks. And uh, I have a question from Alessandro that had to leave, unfortunately, but he, you know, he knows that it, this is being recorded. Uh, yeah, Alessandro is asking me, is, is there any kind of ideal mission proposal or cluster of missions, systems, and or sensors to develop and launch that you would find useful to augment these results? I think you answer a little bit with the future readers, but uh, yeah. other ideas? Yeah, but it, I mean, I think he's talking about beyond just the resource drive. Um, yeah, I mean, to toot my own horn a little bit, <laughs> I was involved with a mission concept study that is, you know, science driven, but also includes the resource effort. Um, it's called MORI, M-O-R-I-E. Um, and this was recently um, made publicly available. This is a NASA funded um, a uh, mission concept led by Wendy Calvin um, out of the University of Nevada. Um, and that kind of lays out our ideas about what are the, the best things to follow up on um, these, these discoveries um, related to ice and the climate of Mars. Um, so there's, there's an, another, um, uh, well, there's many other uh, mission concept studies that were part of that. They're all feeding into what we call the decadal survey um, that uh, that is done every year um, and supported by NASA to, to try to advise NASA what we should be doing for the coming decade, um, not just for Mars, but for uh, planetary science in general. So, I, yeah, I highly recommend going and checking out those reports. Okay. So, I have a question from Jeffrey Landis. He's a little bit confused about the ice consistency maps. What are the units on the scale? And shall I say, just a personal thing, is that uh, you, in, in this presentation of yours, you didn't mention the Drake equation, and this is the uh, context in which everybody knows about that. So, <laughs> right, right. Okay, so yeah, I can expand on that. I mean, um, so we were, in the early days of SWIM, we were sitting around a conference room going, how are we going to get all these data sets to, you know, relate together into a single kind of representation of the ice. Um, and um, 
um, we were inspired by the Drake equation, which is, you know, what are the, the chances of um, communicating with an a, a intelligent race um, somewhere else in the, uh, in the cosmos? Um, and so in a similar way, you know, that involves a bunch of different data sets that all are telling you different things about the potential existence of uh, another civilization in the universe. Um, and, and so they're all kind of put together through this thing called the Drake equation to, and out, out pops the answer. And, you know, the problem with the Drake equation is most of the inputs are not well constrained at all. And so the end result is not well constrained at all. Um, the, to some extent, that's also true with the swim equations that we came up with. Um, but we feel like they're a little more grounded in actual data sets. Um, so what we do is we take each some measure from each data set relating to the presence or absence of ice. Um, and we assign that a consistency value somewhere between minus one, meaning totally inconsistent with the presence of ice, to plus one, meaning completely consistent with the, the presence of ice. Um, and we so we do that for the neutron data, the, the thermal data, um, the geomorphic data, um, and a couple of measures from the radar data sets. Um, and then um, one can then weight the inputs from the different data sets and then out pops the, the composite consistency, um, which itself also runs between plus one and minus one uh, with the same connotation about the, the level of consistency or, or lack thereof uh, with the presence of the ice. Okay. Sorry, I have uh, dealing with some connection problems. And um, uh, the question from Rod, we already answered that. I put it together with another one. So now I have a question from Leonardo Facchini. Leonardo actually is a in aerospace student at Purdue University. And considering how deep the ice deposits are, could a sample mission be beneficial to validate these maps? If so, are there any specific areas already being considered? Question inspired by the recent news of Changi 5 and Mars sample return. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, at, at least from the, um, the current radar, we don't have a very good constraint on the, um, the upper surface of the ice. However, the, some of the shallower sensing data sets like the thermal data and the neutron spectrometer data um, tell us about ice presence or absence within the upper meter. Um, these tend to um, uh, be more confined to the higher latitudes, but there are a few indicators at, at lower latitudes. Um, so these could be areas where one could conceivably go with a, a sample mission that's able to get go down within that upper meter um, and look for and confirm or uh, clarify whether the ice is actually there or not. Um, as far as the radar goes, we really have to wait for that higher resolution radar mission um, to, to truly define where a, a sample return um, mission of that nature would, would be um, successful. Um, and I'm, I'm making an assumption here that the, the sample return mission of that nature is not going to be able to drill down much deeper than a meter or so. I, I could be wrong about that. Maybe um, you know, people will come up with uh, ways to uh, go substantially deeper and sample down in the range where the radar is already detecting the ices. Fabrizio, are you still there? Okay, since we seem to have lost Fabrizio, I'll just ask Les Shoulder's question. Um, <laughs> so Les Shoulder is one of our Stalwart uh, fellows based in London. And mm -hmm. he asks, are the potential large-scale ice deposits at the lower northern latitudes in terrain-friendly areas for any human landings? 
Um, yeah, I think uh, some of them seem to be. Um, there's certainly more follow-up work that needs to be done. Um, the, you know, the SWIM data sets have a relatively coarse resolution. Um, so, um, you know, the, the, the mapping work is largely, um, uh, well, the visible data mapping work is largely based on the CTX um, mosaic of um, the surface. And the, this has a resolution on the order of six to 10 meters or, or, or so um, at the ground. Um, we do look occasionally at high resolution uh, images from high rise. Um, these have 30 centimeter resolution. So, um, but these are not broadly across the whole study area. The, the data set somewhat limited in coverage. Um, but certainly there are um, certain locations. Um, I know people have discussed some in um, conferences and such at, in uh, the Flavor Montes area, in the Arcadia Phoenicia area, um, where there seem to be lower um, rock abundances. I think rock abundance is a, a worry for landing um, spacecraft, both robotic and human spacecraft. Um, the the low-bait debris aprons, unfortunately, tend to have rockier or rougher surfaces, um, but that may not be true everywhere. Um, uh, so far, I haven't seen a, a clear uh, indication of a, a very safe landing site on or next to one of these low bait debris aprons, but I imagine they're out there um, because there are so many of these low bait debris aprons across diverse terrains. Good. I'm, can you hear me, Tan? I'm taking control again. Yeah. Good. Yes. And uh, so we have a question from Dario. Dario, do you want to ask it or I can do it? Uh, write it in the in the maybe it's better i ask it uh, and uh, yes and uh, dario is asking at the end of the mission if it makes sense is there a gradual reduction in the altitude of the orbiter to allow radar measurements at a gradually shorter distances to improve their quality thank you and compliments Fabrizio, maybe you should answer that one. <laughs> Are you asking about MRO in particular, or um, well, mission mission specific? Uh, I I think we are about to crash to Mars in the end because uh, MRO underwent all the planetary contamination uh, cleaning before yeah. launch. Uh, oh, right. and, uh, but I think that the resolution of the radar depends on the frequency, not on the distance. Am I right? Or maybe improve the signal to noise ratio. No, right? If you get closer to the ground, you'll improve the resolution. <laughs> um, we need, we need just to in general terms, the, the you know the, um, the the orbit's fairly close to the very top of the atmosphere currently. Um, you can certainly go down and and impinge on the atmosphere. Um, but if you do that very long, it will start to degrade your orbit and you will crash into the surface. Um, I, I do know that there, there are means to um, keep a, a, a spacecraft in a very low orbit, probably half of MRO's orbit, where it's actually within the atmosphere over a fairly long period of time, like a Mars year. Um, you need a fair amount of um, power uh, from solar panels and, and fuel on board to maintain that orbit. Um, there was a presentation a couple of years ago about a mission concept to do this, um, this low altitude orbit. And one of the big advantages would be to improve the resolution of everything, not just radar with cameras and um, spectrometers, et cetera. Okay, thank you. And uh, I would like to see that presentation you mentioned in the end. And that you say is thanks yeah, a lot. That was in, uh, concept led by Dave Page at um, mm -hmm. uh, UCLA. Um, and it, it was presented at AGU, I think, two years ago. Two okay. Years ago, when it was in Washington, D.C. Okay. So now I have a question from Alessio. And Alessio is online. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you for the presentation. So it is a technical question, but uh, 
roughly speaking, how much would be the expected resolution in ice mapping? And what about other uh, helpful techniques for the future radar uh, shell, for the future shell radar? Right, so, I mean, that's um, not uh, fully defined yet. Um, it's my understanding that, you know, there's a, a number of mission concepts out there. Um, there's been a lot of talk lately about ice mapper uh, mission, um, but I haven't seen a, a clear um, uh, explanation of exactly what the resolution is intended to be. Um, but we're talking about um, sub-meter vertical resolution um, in the in the radar, um, and then I think on the ground, um, probably on the order of 100 meter uh, resolution, and maybe they can improve it over over that by a factor of two or three, um, depending on exactly how things are designed, what the orbit uh, altitude is, and other factors, size of the antenna. Thank you. Sure. Okay, um, I have another, have another, sorry, can I, I go? I, I fear I missed part of Alessio's question. Uh, the other part was just other helpful uh, techniques because of the end of your presentation, you mentioned the wow. uh, other, yeah. Yeah, well, so um, from orbit, I think one of the key things in, in the ice mapping realm is um, it, uh, ensuring that we, uh, we have a good imager. It doesn't absolutely have to be at the high rise level, but you know, on the order of a meter resolution imager um, is going to be very necessary to provide the context at, at the landing sites, especially where we don't already have the high rise coverage from MRO. Um, and then on the ground, there's you know many different methods that can be brought to bear. Um, like electrical uh, sounding methods. Um, I mentioned seismic prospecting, um, the gravity and magnetic um, uh, surveys would also help understand um, exactly what the subsurface properties are. Thanks again. And then sampling too, of course. Okay, yeah, you have a question that just bumped up uh, from uh, from David Newing. Uh, David, do you want to ask it? Uh, but maybe it's better I do it because uh, if you want to fit something back to Tan, just write it. Uh, so the, the question is, this is um, very interesting. Give, given the presence of water, water, we may assume that surface or subsurface biodomes uh, will be viable, but is the Mars magnetic field strong enough to create a reasonable radiation environment? Uh, no, I mean low, probably. <laughs> yeah, the, there's not a um, active magnetic field at Mars. Um, there's some remnant magnetic fields, um, and it's I, I'm not quite sure it's possible that some of them may get strong enough to provide some protection, um, but I think they're more concentrated in the southern highlands, um, and the. Um, you know, so the most likely landing sites are at lower elevations, uh, predominantly in the northern hemisphere, a few places in the southern hemisphere. Um, but I don't think any of the real highest of the remnant magnetic fields are at those low elevations. Um, so yeah, other other means of uh, protection are, are certainly going to be necessary. Uh, you can't rely on the, a Martian magnetic field for that. Yes, on the other hand, uh, answering still to David, uh, you don't need to live on the surface. Also on the Earth, we have proof of li living right, here yeah. in incredible depths, so an incredible oh, environment. Sure. Yeah. yeah, or or you can build, you know, um, uh, habitats and just put a, a meter or two of soil on top of them, I think might be adequate to provide the necessary uh, protection from that. Radiation. Okay, yeah, yeah. I have a comment from Charles about this. This says the crust is too thick for plate tectonics and hence a magnetic field. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure what the um, 
latest thinking is on the uh, connections between plate tectonics and magnetic fields. Um, the, I mean, the um, last I understood, the magnetic field is more driven by interactions at the core mantle bound boundary and at the the solid core inner core boundary and the um, movements within the uh, liquid outer core. Um, but these may also be related to what drives plate tectonics in some fashion. Um, so yeah, right. So there's no plate tectonics and there's no magnetic field on Mars. So these are um, potentially coupled in some way. Okay, and uh, thank you. So you have uh, Charles feeds back that faster cooling produce more mantle movement. Mm -hmm. This is getting yeah, just <laughs> yeah. you're getting out of my realm of expertise here, though. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Okay, and well, you have to be, be prepared in our context, it's always like this we, <laughs> you get always a curveball. I, I know enough to be dangerous, I think. In this, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I have two questions from Alex again, and uh, one I can help answer a little bit. Uh, Charles says mm -hmm. too many geologists. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I tend to sometimes I tend to agree. <laughs> okay. I have a lot of fun. I'm an electronics engineer. I have a lot of fun with geologists, and my house is full of rocks. <laughs> and uh, Tan knows that. And uh, how how would satellite instruments be designed differently? for prospecting. In the, uh, I can answer a little bit that because uh, you have to know that Italy also has uh, an important primate in, uh, in uh, solar system exploration because our spectrometers have been around most of the, of the planetary bodies we have in the solar system. For example, mm -hmm. Saturn also and uh, Jupiter, of course, especially the one on uh, Juno right now, or we have spectrometers, so of course, you know, the comet, but uh, the, the, the asteroids, uh, and especially the very important spectrometers we have around the Earth also. So we have a, a, a very important leadership, let's say, in solar synthesis exploration. So I would say that the spectrometer has the most important one to, to assess the other possible resources, but they work only on the very top of the surface. And Tan, do you want to mm -hmm. add something about uh, yeah. what other yeah, like um, instruments we will need? Right, right. I mean, so there, we haven't talked at all about um, hydrated minerals. Um, so in addition to the SWIM team effort that NASA funded, they've also funded efforts to glean as much information as we can about hydrated minerals at the surface of Mars. And this has been... Um, driven by um, two data sets primarily, the um, CRISM data set on MRO and the um, Omega data set on Mars Express. Um, and so these have been, you know, um, giving us a better understanding of exactly what we can and cannot know about the presence of hydrated minerals at the surface of Mars. Um, one of the difficulties, though, is they can't really um, infer too much about how that hydration um, extends into the subsurface. Um, so there's, uh, I mean, certainly you can do some geological um, analyses and, and infer that certain layers likely have some uh, depth to them, um, but it's, it's a, a lot more challenging and you, you don't get any direct information from the spectrometers. Um, so, nevertheless, I think um, uh, you know it's it's been demonstrated that one can extract the water from hydrated minerals. Um, and, you know, it's feasible to do. It takes a lot more energy than, say, just mining the ice directly. Um, but and, you know, as we're choosing landing sites, we, we don't want to you know put all our eggs in one basket, so to speak. Um, and so understanding the hydrated mineral distribution in a landing site could be extremely valuable as a, a secondary uh, source of, of water. Um, 
and that you know those minerals may have other uses as well, certainly in um, construction at the landing site and uh, and other um, uh, purposes. Okay. Okay, thanks. I sometimes I tend to lose the audio a little bit. It's, it's getting very, very slow for me. Eh? And I have a final question, Steve from Alex. How do you quantify the consistency scores? Ah, I cannot, I didn't read it all. Just a moment. I, I have to. How do you quantify the consistency scores for the individual data set? Data sets. Oh, um, yeah. So each, each data set has a different um, scheme for. Um, translating whatever the data set's measuring to the consistency values. Um, these are all laid out in the um, descriptions on the SWIM website, uh, swim.psi.edu. Um, so, um, so for instance, with the, um, the neutron spectrometer, um, one uh, prior work has mapped a, you know, the detection of the, the neutrons to uh, 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 hyd um, sorry, uh, hydrogen uh, concentration in the near surface, and they present it as water equivalent hydrogen. So we have a fairly direct mapping between the level of uh, uh, water equivalent hydrogen and consistency with, with ice. Um, in particular, I, I mentioned hydrogen minerals, so some of that, um, that water equivalent hydrogen detected by the neutron spectrometer could be tied up in hydrated minerals, but when it exceeds a certain amount, say about uh, 20, 25 percent, um, then you can't really explain it with hydrated minerals anymore. You, you really, the most reasonable explanation is water ice. Um, so if it reaches that threshold and exceeds it, um, then we assign higher ice consistencies above that level. Okay. So I thank you. I don't have any other uh, any other question from the public, and I'm seeing uh, a lot of thanks uh, for this presentation. Elizabeth, do you want to take control back and also get Alistair back into the loop? Uh, I <laughs> Alice is already oh. in, uh, in a Christmas. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Well, nice. thank you very much. That was excellent. And I'm glad we uh, succeeded in, in getting through. Um, it's been an amazing talk. And I think um, you, you battled through all the questions tremendously. So I think, uh, congratulations <laughs> you. on yeah. that. Um, Thanks I, for the opportunity. <laughs> well, I think we're still learning on how to, to use all these different, different systems and Fabrizio has just shown us how, how to master it. So I must thank, first sure. of all, uh, you, uh, Dr. Uh, Putu, for, for actually spending the time with us. I think that's been fantastic. And uh, also, to, well, thank you. And also to Fabrizio for his hard work in, um, in uh, battling through all the questions. And uh, to Elizabeth behind the scenes, because she's been fighting a rear guard action. Uh, being, a, being a military man, I realize how important the rear guard is. Uh, I'm an artillery officer. Um, but yes, it really was fantastic. And thank you all very much. And thank you all to our audience. I see we've still got 133 people involved. So um, it's, it's been a great evening. And uh, I think we've learned a lot. And uh, I hope the questions weren't too difficult for you. No, not at all. Um, some some of them made me stop and think a little, which is always good. <laughs> uh, I, 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 fun, actually. <laughs> I can only ask the questions of how the Airbus, or answer the questions on how the Airbus wing works. Um, uh, <laughs> I can't well, help you there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's the aerodynamics. Um, if I can just finish off by wishing everyone a very happy Christmas. But before I go, I'd like to announce some of the future events we've got happening. Our next live stream talk will be the first after Christmas, and it's on Wednesday the 13th of January by Dr. Stefano Zatti. Until recently, he was Chief of Security at ESA, and he'll be speaking on space and cyberspace, the risk to space missions. So we've got uh, Fabrizio to thank for, for getting hold of him. 
So we'll see how he gets on. And then the next one on the 3rd of February is Apollo 14, A Walk in the Highlands by Jerry Stone, a longtime fellow of the BIS and a presenter and an educator on space matters. Now the third talk is again through the, the, the help of uh, Fabrizio and we've got um, on the 18th of February, a talk by Dr. Paolo Ferri. Until recently, he was the head of operations at ESA, and he'll be telling us all about ESA flight operations. Uh, so that should be fascinating. Now I've got two other events I'd like to talk about. On the 12th of April, the Beyond the Moon conference, we've actually made it virtual now, and there is a call for papers out. Uh, we want to look to the future. We want to start from the moon, and we want to know where to go next, and how we're going to get there and survive considering the 10 barriers highlighted in Jerry Webb's recent article in Spaceflight. Radiation, extended flight time, lack of gravity, self-supporting habitats, infection, which we all know about now, uh, mental robustness, reliance on machine intelligence, economics, socio-cultural and political religious effects. So there should be a complete range of interesting papers coming in on those subjects. And then on the 28th to the 30th of June, we are running our Reinventing Space Conference. And we hope to be able to do it in the QE2 Conference Center in Westminster. And there we'll be looking for papers, the call has gone out, which will cover environmental and sustainability considerations in relation to space, protecting our environment, and space debris. So there's a lot of talks we could in include on those. And finally, we want to talk about the economic recovery in the post COVID-19 era. How can the space industry support the economic bounce back through the creation of new sectors within the space industry, new jobs, uh, startups, manufacturing and training opportunities. So there's a lot going on. And I'd like to all at this point, thank you all for participating and wish you well and have a happy and safe Christmas. Over to you, Elizabeth. I think we're on the on the way out now. Goodbye to all and a Merry Christmas. Goodbye, Tan. Thanks. Bye Ciao. bye. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Thanks everybody. Merry Thank Christmas, you. everybody. <laughs>